Sit over here. Hello, Barbara Mori from Washington Free Press. Um, of the 15 undocumented immigrants that you found, what nationalities were they? Can you break that down, please? And secondly, if a driver refuses to provide his name or address or registration to an unauthorized, a, a random border patrol stop at one of these checkpoints, what is the penalty? You, you wanted the statistics. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. We, out of the 15 apprehensions that I mentioned, uh, six of the individuals were Guatemalan and nine from Mexico. Thank you. The one thing I would like to point out that uh, we did, as we, as we mentioned, uh, um, there were 132 Canadians that we encountered at the checkpoints, 16 people from Germany, eight people from Japan, 10 people from Korea, six people from Switzerland, 14 people from the United Kingdom, six people from Belgium, two people from Austria. I'm not going to read you the whole list. The peninsula here is a very, very popular place for visitors. But a lot zero, of zero apprehensions of those people, those Europeans. They were, they were here legally, ma'am. They were here legally. They presented their documents. I don't know how those Austrians got through. <laughs> <laughs> and all those Canadians, I'm really concerned about that. We've got, we've got another response over here. I also just wanted to mention that, you know, the, the justification for the border search exception to the Fourth Amendment isn't just, you know, it's not really about uh, checkpoints being a great way to, to, buck, to do drug busts. It really is very specifically uh, because uh, you're, you're trying to protect the borders. And, and so, you know, court has, has very specifically said, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter how easy it is to, to get drugs from, from these searches. It's really about, do you think that the stuff that you're after has actually crossed the border? And if, if it's going to Canada, that's not, that's not a justification. Uh, it, it's really about some things coming across into the border that you, you aren't able to get by being at the border. So the other question was, what's the penalty if a driver does not give that information at a border patrol stop? What happens? What's going to happen is we're going to end up spending a little bit more time talking to them and, and trying to find out what's going on with the situation. But uh, when it's uh, um, all said and done, if we once we determine that uh, the, the situation doesn't require any further investigation, we'll release them. Could you be a little more you, you exercise your right to remain silent. So we don't if you exercise your right to remain silent. Here's my answer. If you exercise your mic to remain silent, you're going to first initially, I believe what, what um, Chief Bates was saying, you're going to be sent, funneled off into a secondary inspection. If you continue to exercise your right to remain silent, then the odds are that you're going to be arrested and placed into immigration detention. <laughs> Is that true, Chief? Once again, um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Anne. Anne. Um, we have to have probable cause to make an arrest. Right. Okay, you cannot be arrested without probable cause. We would have, and so, uh, that probable cause when it goes in front of uh, the courts, it has to be there. It can't, it, it, you know, it's, it's not going to flow. All if right, so there. if I may summarize that then, in effect, the result of a driver refusing to give, um, refusing to give any information, including name or immigration status or a driver's license or registration, is that they may be detained for a short period of time, but they still do not have to speak. Is that correct? Once again, when I'm talking about people who are illegally in this country, no, I'm talking about know, drivers. Just no, I was just trying to answer the question. Driver. Let me uh, thank you. The, the the question is, if you're somebody who has a resident alien card, right? You're and you're required by law. A U.S. citizen. A U.S. Once again, a United States citizen has the has the rights that have been explained to you. You know, you don't have to answer. You have to. But, but, but by law, you must present your driver's license or some sort of ID when you're driving the car. And what is the penalty if you do not do so? We would, uh, at that time, we would contact local law enforcement and bring them into the situation. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, no disrespect to, to Chief Bates, but this is one of the things that we've had our meeting for uh, to clarify. 
and we do not have the, the resources uh, or the authority, especially under Washington state law, to issue an infraction or make any other kind of enforcement action because someone has refused to identify themselves. the sheriff, he's not going to come. <laughs> I want to, you know, this is extremely difficult. For, I've been in law enforcement for 40 years, and I, and I also went through the Vietnam era, if I can go just off to a tangent a little bit here, and it is very disheartening to have public policy set by high-level federal officials and the, the antagonism starts coming out to those people who have been tasked to do the enforcement. And I'm not trying to... He's a very articulate, a very caring, and a very professional individual, and I don't have to speak for him. But I would hope that he leaves this gathering here tonight with a memory of, of respect uh, of the people here in the audience. What I am saying, and I'm not trying to be flippant, if there is an incident that occurs at a checkpoint that the Border Patrol is involved in, and one of their individuals is in jeopardy of being harmed because of a disturbance or a weapon or what have you, or a private citizen is, our Sheriff's Office will respond because there is a disturbance and there is a threat of violence at that location. And that's our obligation and that's our responsibility. But we have made it very clear that we will not respond. And an example was what happens if a van pulls up, uh, four people seeing the Border Patrol jump out and head into the woods. Um, our response will be, that's interesting, <laughs> but we are not going to do anything further because unless there is an indication of a violation of state law or county ordinance, um, then obviously we would respond to that as we would to any other citizen. So. Hello. Um, I just wanted to follow up with a piece about that, the, the last question, which is that, you know, if you exercise your right to remain silent, if you can actually do that all the way through the proceedings, if you're an undocumented person who's nowhere in the system, they're not going to be able to prove that, that you are an undocumented person, and they're not, if you exercise your right, you say, I want to remain silent, and you exercise your right to have a hearing before an immigration judge, the government attorneys have to show up at that hearing, and before the hearing can go forward, they have to prove that you're not a U.S. citizen. They have no jurisdiction over you in deportation proceedings if you aren't. However, the problem is that it's very, very difficult. If you're at that checkpoint and you exercise your right to remain silent, you're going to be presumed, there's going to be a, a presumption that you don't have lawful status and you're likely to end up in detention and to be in, put in deportation proceedings and then you're going to have to have a lawyer who can argue that, that you have a right to remain silent and that the government hasn't produced the requisite amount of evidence. When I was litigating cases, I actually managed to, to win a couple. They were some of my favorite legal victories with people who had the courage to do that, but it takes a lot of courage and stamina. Question over.